speakers, uh, you all know, perhaps those of you who have been with us uh, for a few years, and I want to say it's kind of a special story about uh, the wonderful things that are catalyzed when we all get together and think collectively. So uh, in 2013, Dr. Milstein and his Stanford Stroke Squad brought to us um, uh, the Finland example of hitting less than 20 minutes door to needle time for stroke care. Um, and then in 2014, he brought that it was replicated by the Finland team uh, spreading it to Australia. And at that summit, two of the medical directors here uh, came to me and said, this is really important and I want to do this. And one of them is here with us today, that's Dr. Jeff Klingman. Uh, Jeff, would you please uh, come join us here? And uh, what Jeff did was he he said he stayed until seven o'clock at night. He stayed after the reception was over and the cleanup crew was gone. And he said, "Hattie, I am really going to do something about this." And lo and behold, he has. Um, and our wonderful partner, Dr. Mary Ferguson uh, from the Health Services Advisory Group, heard. Jeff, speaking about that in this very room in February about what he achieved in just one year across all the Northern California Kaiser Medical Centers for better stroke care. And she got CMS to uh, provide a grant to spread it across all of one county. So um, what happens here doesn't stay here. We don't want it to stay here. We want it to spread. So thank you, Jeff, for your fantastic work. Thanks. So, uh, <coughs> yeah, so. Exactly. <laughs> we started out thinking about um, you know how stroke care was taking place, and, and before we started it uh, at our various facilities, we had 21 different facilities doing stroke care, acute stroke care, 21 different ways, and started to say, "Now that's kind of ridiculous. What can we do?" So we designed a program. Uh, we had to come up with a fancy name so I could describe it. No alcohol was consumed in coming up with the names, but expediting the process of evaluating and stopping stroke, I have no disclosures. So the thing about, um, for those of you that don't do acute stroke care, sort of the coin of the realm for treating acute stroke is how fast you can deliver um, alteplase, IVTPA. How fast can you do it? And there's a lot of incentives out there uh, the Heart Association has been pushing this for years. Um, the current uh, recommendation is to try and get it done within an hour, and they actually move the envelope to try and get it done actually within 45 minutes. And most people look at that and say, I don't know how we're going to get there. That's almost impossible. And so on. You get a lot of different kinds of awards by going faster here. Um, you've got this get with the guidelines, gold plus target stroke, I think, they're going to start adding garlands and cherubims. <laughs> so the idea is, this is a real challenge. How can you get to go fast enough to be able to do this sort of thing? And I'll explain why, it, why it's a challenge. Um, and, but there, it really is important. It's not just about awards and things you can put on your website. It really is about clinical care. The idea behind a stroke is there's an acute occlusion and there's an immediate area of ischemia. But surrounding the area of the most extreme ischemia, there's an area at risk because collateral flow keeps it um, alive, but not necessarily viable. If you can improve perfusion through the collaterals by perhaps, or if, you, or if you can get rid of that clot and improve perfusion, you can minimize the damage. And so it's been looked at. It was estimated that about for every um, minute, you lose about two million nerve cells. For every 15 minutes, it's been shown, at least in a retrospective fashion, that you get more people home, you get fewer die, you get fewer bleeds related to the uh, treatment, you get more independence of discharge. And so really, time is brain. What we're trying to do is to move this to a faster treatment. You actually have a much smaller number needed to treat requirement um, if you can give it faster than if you can give it slower. And so there's a lot of clinical evidence that you really do want to, if you're going to give alteplase, give it as quickly as possible. And so the other thing that happened uh, last year at the International Stroke Conference is after the previous year where many uh, endovascular trials went down to defeat, they've had at least four or five, now up to six or seven trials, 
demonstrating that in a selected group, endovascular treatment is way more effective than just giving IV alkaplase. And so if you got a, can identify people with a large vessel occlusion and you can catheter treat them, they do much better as well. Um, there's various ways to select, but in the Mr. Clean trial, it was pretty unselected. It was basically NIHSS of two or greater and the presence of a large vessel occlusion within a six hour window. So that's not a lot of selection. That was pretty unselected and yet people still did better. So the real challenge is in this era, how can you give IV alteplase as quickly and efficiently as possible? And you heard the numbers. We can actually, we're talking about getting it in 15 to 20 minutes in the best possible scenarios. Not an hour, 15 or 20 minutes. And that was achievable. Um, in Helsinki, as was mentioned, where they've been working on this for a long time. But the next step, we also need to identify that large vessel occlusion as quickly as possible. Um, you can't wait because, again, time is brain when it comes to large vessel occlusion. And you want to actually not only get them identified, but transfer it if you're not in a center where you can extract it because it doesn't make sense to have all places able to do that. I'll explain that. But you also want to get them transferred quickly. And so there's a lot of challenge along a system-wide way to look at this. So one question you could ask, I mentioned this, why does it take so long to give IV out to place? Well, I'll tell you, here's what happens. They call 911 and the paramedics drive over. And the paramedics do their assessment assessment on the, on the ground. And they take blood pressure and they get a history. So their scene time is important. And then they pop them in the back of the ambulance and they call ahead to the emergency room. And then they transport them to the hospital, and then they get to the hospital, and then they put them in the room. Putting a patient in the room in the emergency room is a 15-minute procedure. If you don't believe it, watch sometime. You got to get in the room, you get on the scale, the IVs get plugged in, you get things plugged into the wall, there's a lot of stuff. And then the nurse sees the patient and talks to the patient, gets a history, and says, oh my gosh, I think it's a stroke. Now, of course, the paramedics already identified it as a stroke, but the nurse has to identify it as a stroke. And then the nurse takes the does the vitals, does the monitoring, draws the labs, weighs the patient, and then they talk to the doctor. And they say, doctor, I think I have a stroke. And the doctor comes in and he talks to the patient, he examines the patient, says, oh my gosh, I think he's having a stroke. <laughs> so then the doctor places the orders, then the patient's taken down the CT scan, then they have to take them off the gurney and move them onto the, onto the gantry, and then they get the CT and then they have to read the CT and then they go back to the emergency room and then the ED doc calls the neurologist and describes the symptoms and the neurologist says, oh my gosh, I think the patient's having a stroke. <laughs> so you go and say, go for the alteplase, then they have to order the alteplase, then you have to mix the alteplase, then you have to deliver the alteplase to the bedside, then you have to decide if, you, if the labs are okay before you give the alteplase, then you do your medicine double check, right, high, high risk medicine. Then you want to recheck the vitals, recheck the exam, and give the drug. This is what happens every day in most every emergency room. And so it's kind of an interesting process. And the thing is, that was mentioned, <laughs> is there's a lot of blah, blah, blah. Now, I stole this from Naratoja, actually. This was his, you know, basically what his slide talked about. Because he was saying, why do you have all this discussion? And frankly, it's amazing we can give it in an hour. <laughs> So, you know, we kind of, what's wrong with this picture? We said, well, which steps are valuable? <coughs> Where are there serial steps that could be parallel? Why do you wait for one thing if you can do something else at the same time? Where are there duplications that could be removed? Where can you give up steps? It's kind of a lean approach to looking at this, if you think about it. And so, fortunately, we had a model, which is Helsinki. Um, and, uh, one of the things that they talk about is doing as much as you can before the patient arrives. Now, Helsinki, all strokes go to one hospital. They have like a 20-minute transport time, so it's super important there. Um, then the stroke neurologist is involved from the very beginning. They greet the patient when they come in and take it over. They go straight to CT. They order the out place as soon as they think they may need it, not after all the stuff is done, before they may need it, and they give the, the drug in the scanner to avoid these transport. And they stopped doing things that didn't matter. They stopped doing EKGs. They're not going to change whether you give this or not. You may find things out later, but it's not going to matter. They stopped most labs. They stopped rooming. Um, 
and then they started to do things all at the same time. Now, of course, as was mentioned, this was Helsinki, and one of the first fears was, well, that's great for Lutherans. They show up early for everything. <laughs> <laughs> that's a big Lutheran cathedral, that big white thing there. Can you translate it somewhere else? And so we were encouraged that they could take it to, you know, the land down under. It seems a little bit more laid back to me. Um, the other thing we found, figured out, thought about about this was labs. Um, I had been doing IV out the place treatment for years, and I can't remember a time I ever didn't give the drug because of an unexpected abnormal lab. And so it occurred to us, if that doesn't happen, what's the value of continuing to do this? If you get a good history and they're not on a blood thinner, why do you wait for an INR to come back? Um, we almost, there's data that you almost never find in unexpectedly low platelets. There's data that the creatinine in a patient you don't know the creatinine, if you get a CT angiogram, simply doesn't cause renal failure. There's data out there. So we just sort of said, let's just let the labs go. So you know, Northern California, I think most people up here know about it, but you know, we've got a lot of people. We've got a lot of geography. Um, we got a lot of doctors, we got, even got a lot of neurologists, and so the challenge is if you're going to do this systematically with all these people, there's thousands of people involved, how do you get them all trained up? And so that was one of the big challenges. Um, so one of our solutions, uh, well, and then the other thing is we were doing pretty well, um, as I before. Everybody gets the, the awards and they get the fancy stuff and all that, and everybody was doing pretty well. We had variability in door to needle time. Everybody, though, was pretty much under 60 minutes, 60% 60 of the time. But there was a lot of variability and not a single system. And we certainly weren't in the 15 to 20 minute range. The other challenge we had is over 21 medical centers, the hospitals tend to be relatively small. And I can't justify having a neuro stroke neurologist sitting there all the time. So how are we going to handle that? It's fine if you're Helsinki. Got a two or three thousand bed hospital, you can have a team hanging out. We've got a bunch of two hundred bed hospitals, so that was important because if you listen to them and from Helsinki and and from uh, Melbourne, they said it's re it, the times are really really good when the stroke neurologist is there and not very good when the stroke neurology team is not. So the problem was we can't justify having somebody sit there, but we need the neurologist involved, and so the solution was. Um, you know, video consultation. So we were going to do video consultation and redesign the process, or if you like, video Helsinki. <coughs> so the <coughs> Teleneurology Hub was developed. We picked a small group of uh, stroke neurologists, um, and we kind of trained them up on how to run this basically code stroke. And um, it's done remotely. You sit in one spot, you run, you're taking care of 21 different hospitals. Um, we also um, it existed in the exam by the ED uh, physician and RN. We run this actually seven to midnight, seven days a week. We didn't put it on overnight for a couple of reasons. One was this was done originally staffed with people who already had day jobs, and so it would be impossible to actually recruit. And the other reason is we don't treat wake-up strokes, and so we know the volume from what we can tell is quite a bit lower overnight, so we sort of said, what's the reasonable time? The other thing we did, which was really helpful for uh, the ED doctors to, to embrace this, was the neurologist orders the TPA. They really like that, because they've always been a little reluctant. You know, ED specialty societies are a little ambivalent about it. We said, look, if we're going to give it, we're going to give it quickly, and it makes sense for us to do. So we order this TPA, you're on your Health Connect, which is our EPIC system, ordering the drug as well as seeing it by video. And we also kind of run the process. So it's done using a telepresence, and I actually sit there in the evenings I, at my home and, uh, and do this or, or go into the office. So you can kind of look at the old process that kind of walked through some of the steps. The neurologist was involved basically at one point saying go, which we really thought was worthwhile just to make sure. Now the neurologist is there greeting the patient as they arrive. So the way it works is the stroke alert is called and I get a call at that point. And ideally if the, ED, if the uh, EMS team can get a medical record number, information on the patient, we can start looking at the chart before the patient arrives. So in my ideal world, I've already figured out who this person is. Um, it doesn't help if they're non-members, obviously, 
because the care everywhere <laughs> link doesn't always work, but imagine if it did. Patient comes, we're actually greeting them with a team. And so you've got those two pictures. The one is the pit crew, and that's really what it looks like. And the other is the team that's actually seeing it. This isn't a, a stock photo, but that's what it looks like. It's, it's everybody swarms. In fact, we said, okay, the, the uh, video has to be at the foot of the bed. RN1 stands on one side, RN2 stands on the other. The tech stands at the head. The ED doc is off to the side. You put in this line, you put in that line. Here's what you do so that everybody had a roll card to specifically do this. Uh, it's generally done in the ambulance bay where I, in my home hospital, there's sort of an alcove where everything's set up and ready to go. Everybody's got their own way of doing it, but we made it important. They don't go into a room. Even if they go into a room for privacy, they don't room the patient. They just do this sort of thing where they jump on. And the stroke neurologist is involved having this discussion with the ED doctor. We do a quick uh, checklist before they leave. We actually order the CT, CT angiogram out to place an ambulance before we leave the emergency room. Now we don't order the ambulance if we think it's not going to need a transport, we pre-notify. But if I've got somebody with a high NIHSS score, there's a high likelihood and again, it's the neurologist making the decision that we may need that ambulance and we tell them to start coming over. It takes about 30 minutes for a CCT rig on average. So they're already driving over while we're taking care of them. Then we transport them to CT. We get the weight on the gurney. That's actually the, the uh, we, we have the gurneys all have weights on them. So we do take them off of the uh, ambulance gurney and put them onto ours mostly to get the weight. It also allows the ambulance crew to leave. Um, we transport them to CT, the neurology uh, neurologist goes with them, bouncing down the hall. Um, I, at the beginning I thought I might need Dramamine, but I've gotten very used to it. Um, and then what we do is we are ordering, again they're preparing the Alta place while they're getting ready. We only call off the stroke alert in two situations at that point, because we've already decided we're going to treat. If there's blood, we don't give it. And if for some reason their symptoms completely resolve, we don't give it. But we don't order it unless we think we're going to use it. But we will call it off if we, uh, if in those two situations. So mostly it's going to get given. And we give it in CT. So the idea is if we can try to get this time down to the 15 minute range. And in ideal circumstances, you can. Interesting thing about strokes is almost no ideal circumstances. That's actually why you need the stroke neurologist. They're all complicated. The blood pressure is too high. You have to verify the goals of care. They've got a pulse. There's no family. There's a lot of things going on. Is it, in fact, a stroke? And so that five minutes of, of a decision is complicated. It's immediately after doing the CT and pushing the alpha place, we want two lines, one for alpha place, one to be able to do the CT angiogram. So before we leave, the CT angiogram is done. We got the uh, neuroradiologist will contact us immediately. So they're on for this, and it's, they've been amazing in stepping up to the plate. You can kind of hear the team involvement, right? ED docs, ED teams, uh, neuroradiology, everybody working together has been amazing. At that point, we go back, we get the results of the CT angiogram. Now they can go back to the emergency room, but with any luck, the ambulance is driving up. And we're starting work on really expediting that part so that the prep happens before the uh, ambulance arrives. They can start working on groin prep. They can get a Foley going. They can get the patient's clothes off. They do the sign out as the ambulance is driving over so they don't have to wait. Everything designed to speed the team. And you also notice the stroke neurologist involvement. I'm actually the one that calls the uh, interventional center and says we've got a patient. So this is what we were able to do. Uh, we started this process of redesign in about uh, March. We started talking about it. We kind of had all the share with the groups get together, the stakeholders get together to figure it out. We did some kind of tabletop runs through the summer and we started testing it in September in one center and then rapidly rolled it out through the region. So the process was started in March and it was live everywhere by January. And that was on purpose because we wanted to get this going and didn't want to wait. And 
Um, as you can see, we've now gotten to where the IV alta place is given in less than 45 minutes, pretty much 80% or more of the time, which is pretty amazing. Um, you'll see, oh, sep September, the case number, there's something wrong with the September data. It, was, it got fixed subsequent to the slide being made. But the other thing you'll notice is we actually about doubled the number of cases that we treat, which is interesting. So we're treating a lot more people. Why is that? Stroke neurologist involved early, taking ownership, less reluctance, um, and it made a huge difference. And in fact, that's pretty important. You know, it's been estimated every patient you treat with IV alteplase saves $25,000 in lifetime um, medical costs. Uh, this is what's happened to the median door to needle. I can't give you more. Uh, Recent data continues to be uh, quite good, just because it's embargoed for publication. Uh, all facilities, the first quarter of 2015, by comparison, you can see we were pretty good, but we were hovering around the 45 to 60 minute range. A few times we got better than that. And you can see the dramatic shift to the left, where the median was down to 32 minutes. Um, we actually were able to treat almost half in less than a half an hour. Um, so the, the other part, we talked about transfer. We get a CT angiogram on almost everybody. It adds only 45 minutes to get that CTA. It's helpful to get two lines. Um, rapid transfer is interesting. I would love to be able to put people in the back of a 911 rig and ship them, but we can't do it without a nurse unless somebody gets a waiver. So this is the sort of thing you're going to hear about um, when we're talking about moving and so on. Um, and then we do need to grease the wheels with accepting centers. They're not all KP centers, so if we're going to a non-KP center, uh, we need to make sure that they're able to take those people quickly and not have a lot of extra steps. Remember, I'm covering 21 facilities. I don't want to spend any extra time on the phone. Um, so we were able to move people pretty quickly. Um, you can see the Swift Prime was one of the fastest ones, and they, when they looked at outside hospital arrivals, you know, it took three and a half hours to get them treated compared to where they uh, came to their own center. This was one of the faster uh, studies done where it was about an hour and a half. And you can see the blue was us in 2015, but we managed to get the time down to sort of split the difference, even with transfers for the uh, 2016. And so we're kind of getting that a pretty, we're on the part of the curve where you get better outcomes. Complication rates really haven't gone up. They're still nice and low and acceptable. And I just put in a plug for the idea that if you're thinking of systematic, uh, how you would design a system, there's been a lot of talk, they're trying it in LA, for example, about paramedics becoming stroke neurologists and deciding who's gonna go get endovascular care. It doesn't make any sense from the numbers. 18% of people we treated with uh, Alteplase ended up with a large vessel occlusion. Only 5% of people that paramedics said were acute strokes ended up needing endovascular care. 5%. They were armed to over, overdo that. So, you know, you basically, if you're going to do some kind of system, you're going to have people driving away from their close hospital to a distant place that doesn't know them. You're going to pass the closer center. You're going to bypass stroke neurology. So I just put in a plug. It makes more sense to identify, treat, transfer quickly. And you do want to give IV TPA first because if you do, you still get good outcomes even in large vessel occlusion. So I think it makes a lot of sense that you can do, you can actually achieve very fast door to needle times. You can actually identify large vessel occlusions. You can actually transfer people quickly. And I make it, I just, this whole field based diversion I think is a distraction from building a system where you can move. So um, th I'll thank you. I have to throw the slide in because one of my docs, <coughs> with too much time on her hand, came up with the uh, KPNC Stroke Force, which is the group that runs it, uh, fast operating remote cerebrovascular experts. <coughs> but more importantly, was I really think she has too much time on her hand. <laughs> um, so anyway, talk, I'm going to give a quick. Uh, uh, plug for Mary. We've talked about this, building a county-wide program, and I said, well, here's what we would want to do. I really want the population to know. I'd like them to be able to know that I call 911. I want to get, you know, how can we get the spread of better door to needle so the entire community can do this? Uh, we want to be able to say, well, what do you do about expedited transfers? How do you get that one telephone call easy thing 
how do you get a faster door to groin? How do you share the results with everybody? And so I'll turn it over to Mary here. Oh, 